Hello everyone. So today's topic that we are going to talk about is total knee replacement. Objectives. At the end of the presentation, you will understand the anatomy of the knee joint, what is TKR, the indications and contraindications of TKR, the types of processes and their advantages and disadvantages. How would you make a, a diagnosis, the risk factors leading to TKR, um, also the surgical procedures involved in TKR, and um, the complications post-surgery and the main important part is the pre-operative and post-operative physical therapy management following TKR. So I'll be talking about the and first thing is the anatomy of the knee joint. So this is I'm just going to give a short overview of the anatomy of the knee joint because this is something that we already know. So knee joint is the largest joint in the body as we already know and it is made up of the lower end of the femur, the upper end of the tibia and the patella. Now the ends of these three bones where they touch they are covered with something called the articular cartilage and this is a smooth substance that protects the bones and enables them to move easily. Then you have something called the menisci. They are located between the femur and tibia that is here. You can see this part yeah uh, just below the acl you can see that is the menisca okay uh, they are basically c-shaped wedges they act as a shock absorber that cushion the joint then you have certain ligaments in your knee joint like the acl um, you have the acl here then you have the pcl here this is pcl and this is ACL here okay and then you have the lateral collateral ligament and then you have the uh, medial collateral ligament so these are certain large ligaments of the knee joint and they hold the femur and tibia together and provide stability the long thigh muscles of the knee joint they give the knee strength all remaining surfaces of the knee they are covered by a thin lining called the synovial membrane this releases the fluid and lubricates the cartilage thereby reducing a friction to nearly zero in a healthy knee. Now let's understand what is TKR. So TKR is a common orthopedic surgery that involves replacing the articular surfaces, that is your femoral condyle and tibial plateau of the knee joint with a smooth metal and highly cross-linked polyethylene plastic. So what is our goal here? One is to relieve pain, two to improve the quality of life of the patient and three is to maintain or improve the knee function. Indications of TKR. To provide motion uh, with stability, to correct the deformity, painful joints with or without deformity, chronic osteoarthritis, traumatic arthritis, non-septic arthropathy, fixed flexion deformity not larger than 15 degrees. Classification of processes. You have three main classification of processes. One is unconstrained or unicompartmental. Second is a semi-constrained or bicompartmental. And the third totally constrained or tri-compartmental. So I'm going to give you a brief explanation of what is each one of them. Okay, so first let's go to unconstrained. So this is used for arthritic joints with no deformity but with significant joint surface erosion. So this is the main point that you need to know. It addresses only part of the knee that's arthritic and leaves remainder of the knee untouched. All the ligaments are left intact. It's used to address medial femoral tibial compartment, outer femoral tibial compartment, and patello femoral compartment. The advantages, it has certain advantages and disadvantages, correct? So the advantages is that it has minimal bone resection and good mobility in all three planes. Disadvantages is that it's a highly unstable joint and long term it has poor results. Semi-constraint. Now this is the largest number of processes many people under TKR, they fall in this category. Severe deformities of varus and valgus and flexion contracture can be corrected. The articular surfaces of the tibia and fe uh, femur of both medial and lateral compartments of the knee joint is replaced by an implant. While the third component, that is the patellofemoral, it is left intact. So in, as you see in unconstrained, uh, it's used to address the three uh, components. That is one is medial femoral tibial compartment. Second is the outer femoral tibial compartment. And the third is the patellofemoral compartment. Here only in semi-constrained there is only medial and lateral compartment of the knee joint. They are replaced by an implant. While the third component is left intact. Advantages is that it has stable fixation, good mo uh, mobility is possible and movement is there in all three planes. Fully constrained it provides 
maximum stability and least mobility so that is one factor and it has one axis of movement it is used in severe ligament damage laxity or in cases of severe deformity the articular surface of the lower femur upper tibia and patella they are replaced by prosthesis and the bone excision is very high fixation methods so you have three main fixation methods one is cemented porous ingrowth and the third one is hybrid uh, technique the cemented one is used for older and more sedentary patients and the porous ingrowth is used for younger age group or more active uh, individuals and hybrid technique is involved it's a non cemented femoral and patellar compo uh, component but the cemented uh, tibial component isn't used this factor is leading to tki this factors you have genetics age family history ethnicity gender gait related disorders and shoes these are sort of some of the risk factors leading to tibia um let's move on to the diagnosis now now first thing that you would see is the patient's history what is the general medical history that which involves the patient's occupation also exercise habits then the past injuries to the knee any gait related problems patient's ability to move or flex the knee that's patient history then you will look into the diagnostic test the physical examination of the knee or signs of inflammation abnormal postures gait abnormality and range of motion so this is something which you will do in the objective assessment part then imaging studies will involve your x ray ct scan or mrm so you can see the processes which is um, uh, done for the patient uh, through an x ray or an mrm aspiration uh, the blood in the fluid usually indicates a fracture or torn ligament the presence of bacteria indicates infection the presence of uric acid crystals uh, indicates gout clear straw colored fluid suggests osteoarthritis arthroscopy is a procedure that orthopedic surgeons use to visualize and treat problems inside a joint uh, contraindications so these are certain contraindications that i have uh, listed down here one is knee sepsis severe osteoporosis poor health a remote source of ongoing infection severe vascular disease extensive uh, mechanism dysfunction skin conditions within a field of surgery example psoriasis obesity neuropathic uh, arthropathy uh, that is charcot's joint mental ill health uh, pyogenic arthritis so these are certain contraindications moving on to the surgical technique involved in tki so the incision is mostly proximal to the superior pole of the patella which extends over the patella up to the medial border of the tibial tuberosity then the inc incision can be uh, either a longitudinal midline median parapatella lateral para uh, parapatella so these are the three types of incisions that can be done it can be either a quadriceps splitting or a sparring approach is used in this case okay complications post surgery you have infection uh, blood clot or uh, dvt or in other words you can say deep vein thrombosis implant loosening excessive joint stiffness and nerve injuries so these are certain complications post surgery pre operative P pt management so this is the main part in our field that we need to focus that pre operative and post operative uh, management so in pre operative the patient is seen for pre operative physical therapy session which includes a review of the tkr protocol instruction for cpm in other words continuous passive motion and um, range of motion exercises ambulation training with standard walker and cane on level surfaces stair training education on the importance of ice discussion on the goals for discharge from the hospital and a review of the financial obligation for home ambulation device post operative pt management so we are going to go day wise like day 1 day 2 day 3 what do you do in each day uh, and how do you progress after that so in day 1 following surgery limb is wrapped in a pressure bandage and a towel or a sponge is kept under the ankle then atm atm in other words is ankle toe movements are done chest pt physical uh, chest physiotherapy uh, is done and um, maintaining the limb in extension by placing a roll under the heel or ankle isometrics of the gluteal hamstrings and quadriceps limb positioning to avoid rotation uh, gentle hip mobility patella mobility good side lower limb mobility exercises 
and upper extremity strengthening started uh, in, in the pre-op phase okay this is the ankle toe movement you can see where the uh, patient moves their ankle up and down so this is basically to improve the circulation and then this is where we keep uh, this is the limb positioning where this is the pressure bandage that is kept and here we keep a towel under the ankle and these are certain chest physiotherapy exercises that we get day two and three now you will continue the same exercises that you did in day one the only additional exercises you will do is assisted slr vmo and uh, faradic re-education okay when the wound drainage tubes are removed then transferring in the bed supine to sideline then from supine uh, to side sitting then you can also teach the patient to stand with a posterior slab or a crepe bandage or hard cotton dressing using a walker and how do you make the patient stand so let's uh, see into that the patient needs to be supported for the first few times just in case the patient feels dizzy the patient is moved to the edge of the bed or chair and one hand is used to push off uh, the bed and the other hand is to push on the walking frame you can see uh, properly in the picture how the uh, therapist is assist assisting the patient here and wtt that means weight bearing to tolerance for these uh, for this it is cemented uh, fixation and for total toe down uh, weight bearing or partial weight bearing it is non cemented okay so let's understand as to how do you make the patient walk so step one, the walker is lifted and placed in front. It is made sure that all the four legs of the walker, they are on the floor. Step two, the patient leans on the walker and then steps forward with the operated leg. So in this case, in the picture, you can see the right leg. Uh, yeah, the right leg is the one which is operated. The other one is the uh, non-operated leg, the, uh, the left one. Okay, so... The patient is here in step two is leaning on the walker and then steps forward with the operated leg and the unoperated is at the back. Walker is step three. Walker is held with both hands and then steps forward with the unoperated leg. So this is how you teach the patient to walk using a walker. Now let's move on to day four to six. What will you do? What kind of exercises will you do now? You continue the same exercises that you did in day one and two. Then you will same transfers in bed, heel drag, you will teach them in supine position. CPM is started and every day you increase 5 to 10 degrees. And then bedside sitting, okay, where relaxed knee movements and high sitting with the help of a sound leg. Then bedside active knee uh, extension and flexion, BMOs, NDARC exercises. Uh, then ambulation without any external uh, aid. By now, the patient should be able to perform at least three to three to four uh, uh, independent SLR with holes and maintaining the lower limb positioning with a pillow below the heel to keep the knee in extension. So these are certain things that you will do from day four to six. Moving on to day seven to 14. Now you want the uh, knee to achieve at least 90 degrees of knee flexion, right? Then, so you will work up to that. And uh, hamstring strengthening you can do in prone position intensive slr can be done uh, then you can intensify the relaxed passive and assisted uh, active knee flexion exercises weight transfers can be done partial weight bearing with the help of crutches can be taught to the patient assisted stair climbing where you move up with the good leg and come down with the back leg okay then from three to six weeks what we can do so you want to increase the range before from seven to 14 days we were doing up to 90 degrees of knee flexion now you want to increase the range of up to 110 to 115 degrees now we can start the patient to uh, like you know on single crutch walking you can teach them stationary bicycle gait training with the emphasis on free knee swinging from partial weight bearing to full weight bearing and hydrotherapy can also be taught to the patient which is a um, good form of this thing that uh, in order to develop strength so it, it also relaxes the patient as well so you can teach them even hydrotherapy um, then mini squats step ups you can do all closed chain exercises can be started at this point of time zigzag walk, uh, walking tandem walking proprioception exercises okay then from six week onwards if there are any deficiencies persisting progress to overcome them accordingly Cane is discarded, normal gait is presumed. You can start with sports specific uh, gentle activities. So what are certain do's and don'ts that you need to follow? 
highly recommended activities are your um, stationary bicycle, swimming, walking, active lifestyle and exercising regularly. What are some things that you need to avoid? Basketball, football, racket sports, contact sports, all that. That's it. Thank you.